Welcome to the Effects of Drugs and Alcohol on the Body and the Brain video series. This is loosely based on Chapter 2 of the textbook for the classes that I teach, sometimes called Chemical Dependency or sometimes with the title Effects of Drugs and Alcohol on the Body and the Brain. In this episode, we're going to talk about drug use yesterday and today. Remember, if you're enrolled in one of my classes, you can submit questions to me either by email or in the online forums. Drug use goes back to the earliest days of human civilization. There's archaeological evidence that alcohol was being used during the old Stone Age. Remember, even during the Ice Age, when ice covered most of Europe, there were places down at lower elevations along the rivers and streams where the ground didn't completely freeze. In those areas, people might collect berries, and we see evidence that they took those berries back into the caves far enough back that there was no light reaching them. There are hollowed out places where people stored those berries and there was fermentation. Whether that was intentional or accidental, I can't really say. We do know that the opium poppy was in use at least 5,000 years before the current era and that there's evidence that cannabis was in use as far back as 2700 years before the current era. Of course, the use then was probably quite different than what we use it for today. Lastly, coca leaves or cocaine source was used at least 2,500 years before the current era. There's evidence from South America from mummified uh, bodies in the very high dry altitudes that the corpses of people in the Inca and pre-Inca civilizations contain cocaine. I think as we get more archaeological evidence from that area, it's likely that these dates will be pushed farther back. If you stay tuned for the rest of this series, you will find that in each chapter we will talk about specific drugs and we'll give you more information on the history of that drug. Drug use has been intertwined with U.S. history. I say only half-jokingly that America is a drug country. We're basically founded on drugs. One of the stories is that the reason the Mayflower stopped when and where it did was because they had run out of grog in the hole of the ship. Grog then was principally beer and rum uh, made from honey and other ingredients. The Boston Tea Party is a very important uh, episode, incident, in our early American history. One of the causes of the Boston Tea Party was that England had placed a tax on tea that made the price of the tea so high that the average middle-class American family had difficulty affording it. In essence, America went to war with Britain partially because of our right to have our caffeine. Notice that after that war, Americans largely shifted from tea to coffee drinking. Lastly, there was a significant event in early American history called the Whiskey Rebellion. Farmers in the western parts of the United States, what was then the western parts, uh, there were very few roads over the mountain. And people who were growing corn found that if you tried to transport large amounts of corn on the backs of mules or horses. By the time you got it over to the cities along the coast, it cost more to take it there than it would sell for. But if they would ferment it into whiskey, it could easily be sold for quite a substantial profit. One mule could carry quite a bit of whiskey compared to uh, the value of the corn it could carry. Well, the federal government attempted to tax and regulate the whiskey, and there was a rebellion. To this day, there are places in mountainous areas in the Appalachians where people continue to make home-brown uh, moonshine. 
When we talk about drug use in America, we get one set of dates. But if we expand that view to talking about drug use in North America before the white man, we see that Native Americans were using a number of substances uh, for a variety of reasons. Among the Aztec, the use of the fruit from cactus was fermented into pulque, probably uh, about 200 AD. Native tobacco was used, although the Native American tobacco was very different from what we use today. Native tobacco was an herbal blend, and in addition to containing uh, leaves from the tobacco plant, it might also contain things like sage or other uh, manzanita berries, other herbal spices. So it was more of an herbal incense and contained much less nicotine than what we have today. In some areas of the, the Southwest, peyote was used, again, used very differently by the Native Americans. In that case, one person, a, a shaman or priest, would consume it sitting in the middle of a circle and have hallucinations and then report those to the uh, rest of the people around them. So the tribe kept the person doing it safe. When the white man came, it began to be popular to use peyote along with whiskey. And as a result, some of those uh, people doing peyote ended up uh, jumping or falling off cliffs and harming themselves or dying. In southern Mexico, into Central America, uh, we saw the use of salvia, salvia divinorum. And in the chapter section on hallucinogens, I'll talk more about that. But again, it was used only by a few uh, priests for religious purposes, not for recreational purposes. Drug use has grown with the United States. As the United States grew and expanded westward, we've seen changes. The patterns of use have fluctuated over time. Many people uh, get used to seeing things the way they are now and assume it's always been that way. But up until relatively recently in the history of the United States and the history of the world, drug use was not regulated and was not illegal. What we saw was as the westward expansion occurred, alcohol uh, was one of the first drugs that was introduced. There are stories of the mining communities here in California where during the, the gold rush, uh, the first business in town to set up would be the saloon. They would put up a tent, two barrels, a board across it, and the saloon was open for business. Uh, during the U.S. Civil War, we saw a lot of uh, the use of alcohol, but also the first use of morphine. Early in the war, the reports are that the uh, officers would give soldiers small pieces of opium gum to chew. In many units during the Civil War, 10 people died in camp from illnesses and infections for every one person killed in battle. Later during the war, morphine, morphine sulfate, was available and would be mixed in with alcohol to produce beverages that would be very sedating. They also, uh, the use of the morphine, resulted in a, uh, treating the, the diarrhea, and so people lived longer, were less likely to die from infection. After the war, many patent medicines became popular. Well, either laudanum or paragoric were widely sold. So many of the men returned from the Civil War addicted to morphine or laudanum that it was common to refer to uh, them as the army of addicts. If oh, the use of laudanum, morphine, and dissolved in whiskey was good for dad, it must be good for mom also. And many women drank soothing syrups, which they would keep in their purses, take a little sip whenever they felt poorly. Uh, so the use of morphine dissolved in alcohol as some sort of beverage was common practice as the United States developed. Drug laws in America have developed gradually. I think it's important for students to understand that each of these laws made a small contribution to the way in which we see drugs today. 
The specific dates are probably not the important thing. In my classes, I emphasize not so much memorizing the date of a particular law, but understanding where that felt fit into the context of American history. The first drug law of any note was the San Francisco Ordinance, which was passed in 1875. Uh, we'll talk about each of these laws in detail in the upcoming slides. But it's interesting to note that this law fits into that period right after the US Civil War. About the 1880s was when universal education was coming along. And so the country was moving from a very rural into a more urban uh, manufacturing kind of environment. And it, this first law applied only to the city and county of San Francisco. Not long after that, uh, in 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed. This law only re regulated the labeling of foods and drugs. Next step came the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act in 1914. This was part of the worldwide pressure to create some kind of regulation on the use of narcotics. Prohibition occurred from 1920 to the 1933 date. Not long after Prohibition, we got the first regulation of marijuana, the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937. After that, quite some time after, in the 1970s, remember after the 1960s and the uh, Stop the War and the Hippie Movement, we got the Controlled Substance Act, which is the basis for much of our current regulation of drugs. Recently, into this millennium, the 2000s, we see a huge increase in the use of synthetic drugs. As a result, in 2012, we re the Congress enacted the Synthetic Drug Act. Next, we're going to look at these drugs and how each one altered our perception of drug use in America. The San Francisco Ordinance was passed in 1875. The ordinance related to the smoking of opium in opium dens. And at that time, smoking was mainly done by Chinese workers who had come to work on the railroads. It's important to remember there was a very strong anti-Chinese sentiment at those times. In fact, one law was passed in California that prohibited Chinese or Orientals from testifying against a white man in court which left them very vulnerable. Uh, often the use of opium was, was only by the Chinese and only in the dens, and the law sought to end that social practice. No smoking of opium in opium dens. Strong racial motivation, possibly because there was concern that white women would end up in the opium dens smoking, and of course you know how awful that would be. Notice that the law did not prohibit the introduction in, of uh, morphine into laudanum, into whiskey, or the consuming of opium in other places. It only related to the use of smoking it and in dens. In 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed. This was meant to control or reduce opium consumption. It required labeling of products which contained opium, morphine, heroin, alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine. Notice it didn't regulate them other than the required labeling. Remnants of this law we still see in our labeling of packages with their contents when you go to the grocery store. This only related to food and drugs at that time. The Harrison Narcotic Tax Act was passed in 1914. This was the result of international pressure aimed at reducing the use of drugs, mainly opium or morphine, but it extended to some other drugs. Some of you history buffs will note that this was an era in which laws were changing radically. Uh, 1913 was the year in which we first had the income tax in the United States. 
The major changes the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act created were that it required a prescription from a doctor to buy drugs. You could no longer just walk into the mercantile and purchase what you wanted. Before this law, it was common for people to order drugs through a mail order catalog and the U.S. Post Office would deliver a cute little box with a syringe and perhaps some morphine and some cocaine powder in it. After this was passed, uh, they had to have a prescription and secondly, all drugs had to be sold in a pharmacy which allowed the government to regulate and tax pharmacies. The law, the way it was written, in, was interpreted that it was to prevent doctors from prescribing drugs to maintain an addiction. So if someone had a morphine addiction, the doctor couldn't give them morphine. This has carried over into our laws today where opiate addicts, heroin addicts principally, can't be prescribed their drug of choice or another opiate, but their uh, prescribed methadone is synthetic. Interestingly, in that era, uh, cocaine was listed as a narcotic. The term narcotic is often abused. It's important to understand what narcotics are. Narco means to put to sleep. A narcotic is a central nervous system depressant, a sedative and pain relieving properties. This is not the same thing as a controlled substance. If you were to be stopped and uh, had in your possession some methamphetamine and the police officer wrote you a, uh, arrested you on the charge of possession of narcotics, when it went to court, the judge would have to dismiss the charges. You, cocaine is not a narcotic. It does not put you to sleep, nor does methamphetamine. But the term was changed from narcotic and now the charge would be possession of a controlled substance uh, under the Controlled Substance Act. Next, we should look at prohibition. And we'll visit more of this in the chapter on alcohol. But prohibition began or grew out of the roots of the temperance movement. Initially, temperance movement was not an effort to regulate alcohol or even to prohibit people drinking. It was to encourage them to drink smaller amounts and to try to reduce the problems from public drunkenness. From this came an anti-saloon league and there are good political reasons why it became the anti-saloon league. Uh, in those days, political meetings were often held in saloons or uh, the equivalent of our modern bars. In the, and at that point in time, women were not permitted to go into the saloons unless they worked there. And you know what kind of women worked in saloons. As a result, women were frozen out of the political process. This occurred just about the time when women were agitating for the right to vote. It's hard to remember that there was a time when grandma or mom couldn't vote. Well, the the focus of the Anti-Saloon League was not on the alcohol, but on prohibiting places where men went to congregate and drink. The idea was that it was okay if they bought product and brought it home or made it at home and drank at home, but not to go out and drink in public. The prohibition was created by the 18th Amendment, which passed in 1920. The Volstead Act is a more comprehensive law, which included information about how it would be regulated, what would be illegal, and how people would be arrested and the penalties. What was prohibited was manufacturing and importing, transportation, and sales. Basically, what was prohibited was anyone making money off of marketing or, or uh, providing alcohol. It did not prohibit drinking. It did not prohibit making it in your own home for your own consumption or for serving to guests, but it did prohibit uh, any place where people might go and congregate to drink. Well, the great experiment lasted only a short period of time and the 21st Amendment repealed prohibition passed in 1937. An easy way for students to remember this is 
There's no drinking at 18, and you can drink at 21. The 18th Amendment made it illegal, but the 21st uh, returned the right to drink at age 21. In the common mind, the idea is that prohibition was a failure. But historians looking back at it question that. Was prohibition a success? Well, uh, there were some definite benefits from prohibition. Drinking was cut by up to one half. There was a huge decline in alcohol-related medical problems. There was a decline in death from cirrhosis of the liver. There were fewer hospitalizations for alcoholism and reduced arrest rates for alcohol-related crimes. All of those sound like some pretty strong benefits. Unfortunately, the introduction of organized crime into the sale of the product uh, was a serious negative. Some other results of prohibition were more marijuana use, more coffee use, a shift to drinking uh, more hard liquor instead of beer. Certainly, if bootleggers had to transport something, it would make more sense to transport a stronger, more concentrated beverage where you could make more money off of a single container. Uh, there was also the shift to uh, speakeasies, places that were illegal drinking, an increase in illegal activity and organized crime. We still see some pictures in the historical uh, archives showing the efforts to enforce prohibition. Marijuana use has fluctuated across the U.S. history and is in flux changing again. Before the 1920s, there was very little use uh, of marijuana by whites. There was an increased use during Prohibition. Use declined after 1937 when Prohibition ended and throughout the 40s and 50s. There was an increased use during the 60s, uh, the anti-war hippie movement, and then in more recent time, there were efforts to decriminalize it so that while it was still illegal, the, the fines and crime, rather than arrest people, they were fined. There was a movement towards medical marijuana. It has recently been le made legal for recreational use. Uh, initially, I said in a few states, but that has gradually expanded to a very large number of states. However, we will see when we look at the scheduling that it is still federally illegal, and that creates some serious problems with conflicts of law between federally being illegal and being legal at state and local levels. The Marijuana Tax Act was passed in 1937. We know that taxes can raise money, but taxes can also prevent or discourage actions. One of the ways in which laws, tax laws are used to alter people's behavior is to make the taxes very, very high, resulting in fewer people doing it. Why was marijuana made illegal? Well, there are at least three uh, theories that have been proposed, probably more. One is that the agency under Anslinger that was responsible for enforcing prohibition, a lot of those um, Elliot Ness type people uh, were out of work when prohibition ended. And so that agency moved into finding another drug to go after. Another story is that in those days, most of the uh, freight that moved in the United States moved by uh, boat. There were no highway systems until after World War II. So if you wanted to move something in the early American times, it either was on uh, horse or wagon or more easily uh, by boat up the rivers. And at that point in time, New Orleans was probably the principal port in the United States, rivaling New York City. Uh, lots of goods went up the Mississippi and then out and through the various other rivers. Well, in those days, there were no cranes and forklifts. 
castings had to be removed from boats on the backs of longshoremen, and there was a critical shortage of dock workers. Well, where do we get dock workers? Many of them came on the boats from uh, the Caribbean, from uh, Jamaica, from Cuba, and so on, and many of those dock workers were black, dark-skinned. As a result, they brought with them their habit of smoking marijuana. Well, this wasn't a big problem as long as it was something that black people did. But uh, as the trains became available, it was common for students, white students from the East Coast, to go down to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. And when they returned, they brought with them bags full of this wacky weed. Well, this horrified the people on the East Coast that young people would be smoking this and there was tremendous pressure to uh, make the drug illegal. Another story that may have played into this is that uh, Mexican farm workers used to come freely across the border and work. Many of them lived in labor camps and they did not get paid until the, after the harvest. They would be given room and board and meals, but uh, not their pay. Many of those Mexican farm workers smoked marijuana. Uh, well, some uh, unscrupulous growers or labor contractors discovered if they called immigration just before the harvest was complete and those workers were rounded up and deported back to Mexico, then the farmer didn't have to pay them. And so uh, the effort to make it illegal was an effort to control uh, people of color and the law mainly uh, was used as an instrument of controlling people of color in the early days. Cocaine use has gone in and out of fashion. In the 1800s, it was used in tonics and patent medicine. It was also added as an ingredient in some wines. We see that today among people who are heavy drinkers, who will then do a little bit of cocaine, or more recently methamphetamine, to keep themselves alert so they can continue to uh, consume more alcohol. Initially, it was done as powder, and movies and movie stars and entertainers' use of powdered cocaine uh, glamorized it. Later, it began to be used as freebase, uh, and because freebasing required a very volatile substance, it frequently exploded or caught on fire. More recently, uh, it's become possible, the technology, to mix the powdered cocaine with other ingredients and bake it and create a substance called crack cocaine, the name coming from the noise that the uh, cocaine that's rocked up that way makes as it cools. Making of crack cocaine resulted in small pieces being readily sold at lower prices and more use in the inner city. When we get to the section on cocaine use, we'll have a whole video on that. We'll talk about this in more detail. When we talk about drugs, there are other drugs we need to consider. One is amphetamines and methamphetamine. If you work in mental health or medical settings, the ICD or DSM will only list amphetamine and methamphetamine is included as one of the amphetamines, but people who work in substance abuse will find separate lines on their forms for amphetamine and methamphetamine. Amphetamine is usually in a tablet form and is a prescription drug, where methamphetamine is usually available in a powder and is an illegal street drug, though both uh, forms can be diverted and used for getting high. Also, we need to talk about club drugs, which could cover a wide variety of things, just things that are used at raves and clubs. MDMA, called ecstasy and sometimes referred to as molly, meaning molecule or the pure powdered MDMA, is probably more common on the east coast of the United States than on the west, and often it turns out that what is being sold as ecstasy or molly is mixed with a lot of other ingredients. We need to refer to and talk about inhalants, methcathinone, which is a general name, a specific chemical, but part of a family of 
uh, hundreds of different synthetic drugs, often sold as bath salts, and there are new emerging synthetic drugs on the market. Other drugs we'll discuss in this series and in the class I teach are LSD, PCP, nicotine, which is from tobacco. There's been an increased interest in caffeine, and we need to examine that. Alcohol is probably the perennial drug and is often used in combination with all of these other drugs. And combinations of drugs, alcohol and other drugs, are often more dangerous than either separately. Some people use and abuse over-the-counter drugs. Prescription drugs are important in talking about about drug use and abuse because just because you have a prescription for something does not make it safe. Uh, also psychiatric meds and so on. All of these will be covered in upcoming uh, sessions of videos. In the United States, controlled substances, drugs, are scheduled and there are five separate schedules. Schedule one drugs are uh, those drugs that may not be prescribed by any doctor. It's important to think about the strange case of thalidomide. At one point, thalidomide was being prescribed commonly in Europe and given often to women who tended to be uh, anxious and nervous. At least that was the belief in those days that women were more anxious than men and might need medication. One of the doctors at the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, a female doctor, didn't want to approve it because she was concerned about the safety of the drug. And she got a lot of pr uh, pressure to sign off and allow it to be used here in the U.S., but she didn't. Now she is recognized as a hero, though at the time there was a lot of nasty things said about her. It turned out that when people take thalidomide, uh, when a woman who is pregnant gets it into her system, whether she takes the pill or, or simply uh, the powder gets on her skin and is absorbed, if she is pregnant, whatever part of the fetus was developing on that day doesn't develop. So there are still people alive in Europe who uh, mothers were exposed to or took thalidomide they may be missing legs from the knee down or hands or part of the skull or various parts of their body didn't develop because of the thalidomide that was in the mother's system on the day that that part of the fetus should have developed. So there are some drugs that are simply too dangerous or don't have any real medical use or have such a high abuse potential. Heroin is an example of that. So likely to be abused that in scheduling, it's a Schedule I drug, may not be prescribed by a doctor. Schedule II drugs are high abuse potential, but do have some recognized medical uses. Those require a triplicate prescription. Uh, those laws have tightened considerably since the opioid epidemic. Prescriptions uh, on triplicates now must be serial numbered. Uh, there's a lot of uh, inspection of doctors who are prescribing these. In order to prescribe uh, these Schedule II drugs, a doctor must have a DEA number, and that is heavily regulated. Schedule III drugs basically require a prescription, have some abuse potential. Schedule IV uh, require a prescription, but have a lower abuse potential, and so they're not watched as carefully. And lastly, Schedule V drugs have extremely low abuse potential. Some of them can require a prescription or be an over-the-counter drug depending on the dosage. For example, pain relievers, uh, Tylenol, acetaminophen, and, and uh, ibuprofen, 200 milligram pills are sold in over-the-counter in pharmacies. 600 and 800 milligram pills have to have a prescription because of the risk of overdose if you take too many. So these schedules set up a lot of the way in which various drugs are handled, uh, both medically and legally. And we'll see more about that as we move through the subsequent uh, chapters or videos on other types of drugs. This 
putting drugs on schedules sometimes creates problems. Some examples. Marijuana is scheduled as a Schedule I drug. This means it is federally illegal for any doctor in the United States to prescribe it. Well, how are there marijuana doctors writing prescriptions for medical marijuana then? Turns out, doctors are not licensed by the federal government. They're licensed by states. So if a doctor writes a prescription for marijuana, there's little that the federal government can do. The one thing they can do is take away that doctor's DEA number. So a doctor who prescribes marijuana cannot work in a hospital or prescribe uh, heavy duty painkillers and a number of other schedule one drugs. There are some doctors who um, have had problems with their license or choose to do marijuana, but that means since they prescribe marijuana, they cannot have a DEA number and they cannot prescribe any of the drugs on schedule two. The Analog Act is also a modification of the scheduling. It came about in 1986. And the reason for that is, as new drugs were invented, uh, they had to be scheduled. And so if they were not scheduled, someone could come up with a drug that was similar to, say, heroin, but added a little something tacked on to one of the, the molecule. So it had a new chemical name and formula even though it did almost exactly the same thing as heroin. Under the Analog Act, it's no longer required for the new drug to be tested and proved to be a problem. If it's substantially like an existing drug, which is scheduled, then the new analog is considered to be the same as that. The Synthetic Drug Act of 2012 was aimed at curtailing the massive number of new synthetic compounds that were being created, which had uh, properties. And we'll see some of that in the chapter on synthetics when we talk about bath salts and related chemicals. But the goal there was to regulate that. The problem is that new drugs are being created faster than the federal government can test them, find out what they are and what they do. One way that the companies, the people who want to be involved with synthetic drugs have gotten around the laws is to label these products as industrial chemicals, not for human consumption. Then they are imported, even though someone may divert them and begin to sell them for human use. Also notice that the two most prominent drugs in American society, probably the two that kill the most people, alcohol and tobacco, are not scheduled. Uh, they are under food and drug, not the Department of uh, DEA controls, uh, so Drug Enforcement Agency. So our laws leave large um, differences in the way that the two most common but most uh, toxic, poisonous drugs are currently handled. Some recent drug-related events that we will need to talk about throughout the class or this video series on drugs. One has been the war on drugs. For example, over a 20-year period here in California, the number of people in prison increased 1,100%. All of that behind uh, drug convictions. With a large number of people that were arrested, presumably my city and yours, are now the safest place in America because there are no longer any drugs on the street. If you're laughing at this point, you should be. The war on drugs has not turned out to be a success. In fact, there are many people who believe we lost the war on drugs. We are now reducing penalties and uh, allowing people out of prison with previous low-level drug charges. Another area has been the passage of many, many more laws trying to regulate various drugs and how and when. Drug testing is a new important uh, area. Who can be tested? When can they be tested? How can the results of testing be used? Uh, an interesting case that went to the Supreme Court, while medical marijuana may be legal, uh, courts have held that employers can fire you if you test positive for marijuana. Why? Because if it's in the bloodstream to test, then you are under the influence of the drug when you are at work. 
however strong or mild that influence is, they've said that you cannot have it in your system. Since marijuana is a Schedule I, federally illegal drugs, people who work in areas that are regulated by the federal government, uh, utilities, uh, transportation, etc., uh, can be fired from their jobs or if they are caught with a positive marijuana or other drug test, can end up doing uh, as long as a five-year drug treatment program in order to keep their job. Another area we need to look at is athletic use. Um, when is it banned? We've seen some high-profile uh, news stories and cases about this, about athletes trying to get a competitive advantage by finding a drug they can take that is not currently banned. Uh, late in this series, chapter 16, includes some things about prevention, and certainly the field of drug treatment has changed dramatically over uh, the last, uh, well, since the late 1930s. And before that, it wasn't generally considered a treatable disorder. Now it is. Uh, so in a, later videos, uh, I'm going to talk extensively about drug treatment, how it's organized, how it's funded, and so on. Here's a list of terminology that may have been new to you, but is included in this. Part of what students who are studying the field of drug counseling or mental health counseling need to learn is the vocabulary. And I found in teaching uh, classes that often the reason students get test questions wrong is because they didn't know what some of the words meant. Certainly, uh, these are terms that were covered in this chapter that you should understand. Amphetamine, bath salts, we'll talk more about that later, but uh, fermentation, we'll talk about that in the chapter on alcohol. Prohibition, narcotic, what's a narcotic? Controlled substance, what's a controlled substance? What is an analog? And what were patent medicines and what kinds of places were speakeasies? As the amount of information on drugs and drug treatment has increased, I think it becomes difficult for students sometimes to decide what are the big important things they should understand and what are the minor things that uh, may be nice to know but aren't mandatory. So I've begun to add at the end of each presentation when I teach classes uh, what you should have learned from this chapter. Now this assumes that the students have read this chapter, then seen this, the PowerPoint, or in this case, watched this video. But the big things that we've talked about in this section are when did humans first begin to use drugs? And I gave you a, a list of times for various drugs. How has drug use affected the U.S. and world history? We'll revisit that question, but you'll see that drug use is intimately connected to world history. Then you should understand the major drug laws and the place in history, the San Francisco Ordinance, set right after the U.S. Civil War. The Pure Food and Drug Act, the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act, both occurring around the time of World War I. And then prohibition through the 20s and early 30s how things changed with the end of Prohibition and then the Marijuana Tax Act, which began in 1937. Lastly, you, uh, you should understand the new Controlled Substance Act, new in 1970, though old at this point, 50 years old, but how that's shaped our approach in the United States towards various substances. And the new problem of synthetics, which is only now being addressed with the Synthetic Drug Act. So you should understand each of these laws and what they did and didn't do. It's important to think about prohibition. When did it start? What laws govern the enforcement and when did it end? And what are the five major drug schedules and why are drugs placed on each of these schedules? Understanding this can give you a lot of insight about both drug abuse, abuse potential, treatment, and legal events in the field. I hope this uh, video helped you to understand this section on the history of drug use. We'll continue with more in the upcoming videos and we'll talk about 
history as it relates to specific drugs.